uh, that last uh, song was written by Charles Wesley, and uh, he wrote that hymn soon after he was converted. Uh, and as he looked back on his life, uh, he saw himself uh, as a prisoner in a dark dungeon, chained by the, the sin, uh, the sins that he had committed, and even more made captive by the sin that was part of his very being, his, 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 the old man within him. And one night the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that Christ had died to meet his need, flooded into his own, as it were, personal dungeon with light, uh, breaking the chains of guilt and setting him free. And for the first time he seemed to be really alive because he possessed this supernatural life of Christ. Uh, and he realised that uh, what Paul had said as we read at the beginning of uh, Christ was in him. And you would think that the testimony of that him describes the experience of someone uh, who was rescued from a life of some terrible sin or a life of ruin, maybe drugs or adultery or murder or goodness knows what. But listen, at the time of his conversion, Charles Wesley, at the time of his conversion, Charles Wesley had been a pastor in a church for over three years. And he just returned from a, a missionary trip to America. But in all of his religious activity, he had never experienced peace. The peace that only God can give through the confession of sin uh, and making Christ the Lord, the King of your life. He looked good on the outside for a number of years, but the the mystery of a committed life to Christ was a brand new experience for him. And so uh, on May the 20th, 1738, 1738, that's 285 years ago, Charles Wesley was saved. He was converted, even though he was a pastor. And he finally began to understand the great mystery of being in Christ. No condemnation, he wrote, now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine, alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Beautiful words, words of personal testimony. Uh, you see them on the screen there when Keith brings them, brings them up. That was Charles Wesley's testimony. A minister, a pastor for three years, but not saved until Christ came in and saved him. And then he wrote that song that speaks about that great experience and so on. But you know, in all of human history, only one timeless eternal event has ever occurred, and that's the cross of Jesus Christ. And the cross of Jesus Christ stands at the spiritual crossroads of every man, woman, and child. And the Bible declares, and, and history confirms, that nothing will ever survive the wreckage that is human civilization, which doesn't in some way link up with the cross of Jesus Christ. The crucifixion of Christ not only occurred uh, 20, 2023 years ago or so, but it's, it's something which also takes place and should take place uh, in every Christian's life daily. And that's why the cross is regarded as a timeless event. And it's been affecting human history long before it even occurred in time, even back in the dim reaches of eternity past. And it's still affecting lives centuries from Christ's day until this very day because it's a timeless event. And every day you and I are called to live our lives as a manifestation of working out of a cross-centered life. In his book, and it's on the screen there, you can get a hold of it, it's well worth the read, A Cross-Centered Life by C.J. Mahaney. He says, many Christians search in vain for something new that will put all the pieces of their faith together. But the missing ingredient is not really missing at all. The truth of the gospel 
is not only the entry point of our faith, it's also our only help for the present and hope for the future, resetting the compass of our life to always point to the atoning work of Christ. Take a look at that quote on the screen one more time. The missing ingredient is not really missing at all. It's to always point to the atoning work of Christ. And you know, the work of the cross, the work of Christ, is very vividly and dramatically uh, shown to us in the book of Esther. And we've noted many, many times that God is not mentioned in the book of Esther, but we've come to chapter 7. And if you open your Bible at chapter 7, if you've got a Bible with you, uh, we're going to uh, read it. We're going to actually listen to it being read in a moment. And so let's go there, because this is a very dramatic turning point in the story of Esther, and it speaks very, very uh, vividly and it illustrates so very well the work of the cross of Jesus Christ. And I hope this morning, as we get into it, when we've heard it read in a moment, uh, you're going to understand something that perhaps you've never understood before, but what the cross actually means. And then towards the end of the service, we're going to come uh, to, to, to the celebration of the Lord's Supper. So let's just listen for a moment to this dramatic portrayal uh, in chapter 7 of what's happening in the story. If it comes up, I think it should, Keith. So the king and Haman went to drink Esther's banquet. And as they were drinking wine on the seventh day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then, Queen Esther asked, If I have found favor with you, Majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me that This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. And as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then, Queen Esther asked, If I have found favor with you, Majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me that. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold, to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, what? I would have been quiet. What are you saying? Because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked, Queen Esther, who is he? Where is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing? An adversary! Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wife, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then, Mahoma, one of the eunuchs attending, came to say, A pole reaching to a height of 50 cubits stands by Haman's house. He had set up Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Impale him! Very dramatic uh, incident here in Esther chapter 7. And chapter 7 opens as you read or as you listened with a, a private supper in a banqueting room where Queen Esther, the king, and Haman, that, that evil, sinister prime minister, were gathered. And just the three of them. Uh, and it closes with a man nailed to a tree, impaled on a tree, 
until he's dead. And this reminds us, and I hope you can see this as we, as we look at this together, it reminds us of one of those timeless foreshadowings of the cross in the Old Testament. Here's Haman, a descendant of Agag, the Amalekite, a sworn enemy of God, who's plotting, as we've already seen in this series, to destroy the people of God all over the empire of the king and to exalt himself. And this is a picture of the old sinful fleshly nature within each of us. We have a Haman within each of us. That deadly ego which has as a central purpose the exaltation of ourselves, which hates the control of God in our lives and tries every which way but loose to, to prevent us from yielding to God, the Haman spirit. And then there's the queen, Queen Esther, who's been informed by her wise cousin Mordecai of exactly what's happening, uh, this plot to kill the Jews, including her, uh, and her decision then to, to move to prevent this disaster. And this is a picture of the new spiritual life that we have in Christ, which is indwelt, taught by the Holy Spirit, recognizes the true nature of the flesh, and is the base from which God moves in our lives to prevent us from falling into sin. And finally, there's the king, King uh, uh, Xerxes, who's naive and ignorant of what's going on in his kingdom. And this is a picture of our souls with all its power, the soul's power and, and the soul's will, but also the pr propensity to be of our souls to be blind and to be ignorant of the spiritual battle that continues to rage within us even after we're saved. And as we consider this banquet, this supper, I'm reminded, as we remind ourselves shortly, that centuries after this supper, another supper was held in a private banqueting room upstairs in the building in Jerusalem. And a similar situation unfolded during the Lord's Supper. So the king Sorry for that. You're doing well, Keith. Thank you. The, 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 the Lord's Supper. There are 11 disciples who don't know what's going on. Their hearts are troubled and they're concerned and full of questions, not fully realizing what's going on. There's Jesus, the Lord and Master, the perfect Son of God, indwelt by the Father, filled with the Spirit, fully aware of the danger of the hour, preparing to move to redeem the world from a great tragedy. And then, along with the eleven, there's Judas, isn't there? The traitor who's plotting to betray and destroy the will of God in the selfish pursuit of his own will. And now that the supper, uh, that supper has, uh, that supper in Jerusalem, in the upper room, you remember it also ended with a man hanging and dying on a tree. But, but I'm not talking about Jesus. Listen now, I'm not talking about Jesus. He did die on a cross. But I'm talking about Judas as well. Because we read that Judas went out and hanged himself. Just as Esther, Haman, and for all practical purposes, uh, as, as in Esther, Haman hangs himself. You see, he was impaled uh, on a gallows. You see, wherever there's a cross in Scripture, it's always, it's always there for one purpose. And one purpose only. It's there to put an evil man to death. And listen, even the cross of Jesus was for that purpose. And that might shock you as a statement. We know that Jesus was not evil. We know Jesus to be the sinless Son of God. And he was and he is. But what we don't fully appreciate is on the cross. Listen now, listen on the cross, Jesus became Haman. One of the most amazing sentences in all Scripture is Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians, we, He who knew no sin was made sin for us. It was also prophesied by Isaiah that the Lord would lay on him, that is on Jesus, the iniquity or the sin of us all. That is on the cross. Jesus was made to become sin for us. He was made to become all that sin is. 
and God's response to sin, what's God's response to sin? It's to nail it to a cross. To put it to death. And that's what the Bible says took place on the cross. Jesus became sin for us. God put him to death. And the same thing becomes true for each one of us every day. When we take up our own cross to follow Christ, and we allow him to put to death all that is of self and sinning in our lives every day. And without that, the cross of Christ, with all its possibilities of salvation and deliverance, is useless. And Christ suffered and died in vain. If it finds no translation into our own experience every day. When we believe and we act on that belief, that's what belief is, acting on the principles set forth in the message of the cross, then the meaning and the power of the cross becomes very real in our experience. And all of the action of chapter 7 in Esther is a picture of the only way a Christian, you and I, can find real victory over, over the subtle, self-loving, self-pleasing, self-pitying, self-defending, self-asserting urges that arise within us. And I want to share with you this morning, in the next few minutes, there are three steps revealed here in Esther chapter 7 that are so simple and so practical that I believe that they can help each of us to root out any and every sin in our lives and to live for Jesus more and more each day as we take up our cross and follow him. First of all, notice with me the obvious. That's the revelation of evil or of sin. This is the moment in your life and in my life when in a flash of insight or conviction you see yourself as you really are in relation to maybe some person or circumstance. One way or another God opens our eyes to see some sin in thought or word or deed which we've been treating a little bit like a friend, sometimes defending, protecting, even making excuses for. But now we see it in its true light and the spotlight of God's Holy Spirit shines into our hearts and convicts us. It may be something that you've said. It may be some attitude that you have. It may be some behaviour that you engage in. But somehow God speaks. God speaks maybe through a friend. Or from the scriptures. And the Holy Spirit in a moment brings a revelation of the truth of who we are and what we're like. And that's what happened here. Haman, the friend, so called, is revealed as Haman, the traitor, the enemy. And when this revelation of the truth about some sin comes, it's almost, almost always followed by some conflict within. Notice the first sentence of, of, of chapter 7. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And as they were drinking wine on that second day, the king asked again, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What's your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be, it will be granted. And then the king, after a bit of a conversation with Esther, he leaves and goes outside. And now he knows who the real enemy is. The real enemy has been exposed. Why doesn't he simply have him and dealt with there and then? Well, instead he gets up and he goes out into the garden alone. And you can imagine him maybe pacing up and down, talking to himself. Here's this man that he thought was his right-hand man. Haman is actually a traitor. And he's rightfully angry at Haman, but he's uncertain what to do. Because after all, Haman is the Prime Minister. And it's a very radical step to execute the Prime Minister. Well listen, you and I have a similar for, formidable, formidable enemy. One that will give you more trouble than any other. And try to keep you from enjoying your relationship with God. He'll keep you in turmoil. He'll hound you day and night. And he'll fight you every step of the way. Without regard to who you are. Or what you do. Or how old or young you are. Or how spiritually mature you are. You can't escape, you can't avoid or hide from this enemy because, listen, do you know why? Because the enemy is you. The enemy is me. You and I are most often our own worst enemy. Paul admitted that. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. When I want to do good, I don't. 
And when I don't want to sin, I do. And I'm sure all of us, if we're honest here this morning, can identify with that expression, as Paul puts it like that. Your other enemies may come and go. You may outlive them all. But for all of your life, you are stuck. Listen, you're stuck with you. And it's on the battlefield of your heart and mind that you'll fight your toughest battles. Will I surrender to God or not in this moment about something? Will I obey him or not in this moment about something? Will I answer his call to go somewhere or to do something or not? Will I choose to live a life of purity, of holiness, of righteousness or not? Will I forgive or not? Will I express love in this situation or not? And on and on and on it goes. And so turning the spotlight on us when we finally see ourselves in the wrong in some way before God, perhaps after years of justifying or excusing ourselves and our behaviour and our speech, we know that if we admit and renounce our sinful ways, it's going to mean a deep and a radical adjustment on our part. Maybe it's a deep-seated habit of a lifetime that has to be dealt with. Or maybe a whole lifestyle that we've been living that has to be changed. Or we have to humbly approach maybe someone that we've sinned against and ask for forgiveness. Or we have to make restitution about something. In any event, it provokes a struggle within us and we will, we will be tempted to compromise and to ignore it. Ignore it. We feel a strong urge to just gloss over it or to turn over a new leaf, try harder to be better. You remember in the New Testament when the rich young ruler came to Jesus, he revealed that young man's heart to him and he showed him how his love for what money could give him possessed his, his life. And Jesus said to him, go and sell all that you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. But he went away sorrowful, the scripture says, filled with a struggle, not willing yet to call the thing that is craving for money, the enemy that it was, and Jesus, looking after him, was grieved because he loved him. You know, quite a few years ago, I was diagnosed with elevated blood sugar. That's another fancy name for type 2 diabetes. And although my blood sugar level is borderline uh, at that time, I had to start taking some medication to learn new eating habits around how much sugar I could have, I'm still learning that, as well as to have three monthly checkups with my GP. And, and I continue to have to watch what I eat. And speaking generally, let me just say it's very unwise to ignore symptoms of poor physical health. And we men are very good at that. You know, we think, oh, we ache or pain, it's nothing, I'll just go on until it gets to a point where we have to go to the doctor. But you know, the same is true of our spiritual health. Many people ignore symptoms of spiritual disease, thinking mistakenly that by ignoring the symptoms, their condition will get better on its own. But of course, it won't because it can't. As we've already seen in this series, God is always at work in the detail, uh, details of our lives communicating to us by his spirit that he loves us and he wants to help us deal with our, our problems to do with sin and sinning ways. And so we need to work with God to let him diagnose our spiritual condition. And then, secondly, we need to work with him to heal our hurts and our habits and our hang-ups. So what went wrong with Haman uh, in his life that he became so blind, he became so egotistical, a cold-hearted man. Why did he become so dangerous and so malicious, so much of a threat that God had to judge him? What led him to being hung on the gallows he built for somebody else? Well, somewhere along the line, Haman had ignored the symptoms of a disease that was slowly but surely eating away at his life. Oh, he was the second uh, highest official in ancient Persia. 
He had fame, he had wealth, he had power. And when he walked the streets of the capital city, everyone bowed. He should have been a very satisfied individual, but instead, remember what he said in chapter 5 and verse 13, but all this does not make me really happy, he said, when I see that Jew, Mordecai, sitting at the king's gate, refusing to bow down to me. Haman was so greedy that he was always counting his cravings instead of counting his blessings. And he became obsessed with the one thing he couldn't have and it robbed him of peace and happiness in his life. He was consumed by Mordecai's conscientious refusal to bow to him and it ate away at him. And the truth is that this has always been part of the human problem since the Garden of Eden. Remember, Adam and Eve had everything and yet they wanted more. I wonder if there's something you crave in life that you think will make you happy. Is it more money or possessions or position or power? Whatever it might be, don't ignore God's diagnosis of your spiritual condition. Haman did and it ruined him and it will mess up your life and my life too if we ignore God's convicting Holy Spirit in our lives. And so if, you always, if you're always seeing life as a half empty glass and you want more and never been satisfied, learn from the Apostle Paul again in Philippians. I have learned, he said, to be satisfied with the things I have and with everything that happens. He said, I know how to live when I'm poor and how to live when I'm, I have plenty. I've learned the secret of being happy at any time in everything that happens. When I have enough to eat and when I go hungry, when I have more and when I have need, when I do not have enough, I can do all things, he says, through Christ, because he gives me strength. You see, once God makes that spiritual diagnosis and helps us to identify our enemy within, we have a choice to make. And notice that nowhere in the entire book of Esther do we find Esther or Mordecai taking any issue with Haman himself. They don't plead with him. They don't try to rebuke him. I've said before, rebuking the devil is not in God's word. They don't fight with him or do anything else. And we're not told that they even spoke to Haman directly. They did the only thing that was going to help. They went straight to the top. And that's the only way out for you and I. Only one possible escape from Haman's tyranny within. And the only way is to go to God and to pronounce the sentence of death. When the king returns from the garden, he sees Haman half fallen on the queen's couch, down on his knees, pleading for mercy. And the sight of it revolts and disgusts the king. And at that moment, a servant reminds him, you know, sir, there are gallows in the house of Haman, which he built for Mordecai, the man who saved your life. And being reminded of Haman's true character and conscious of this evil plot against the Jews, the king pronounces Haman's doom and he says, Hang him on the tree. And what an irony we see in the next scene in this tragedy, because that's what it is. This all started because Haman had been furious because a Jewish man wouldn't bow down to him. And now he's prostrate at the feet of a Jewish woman begging for his life. He wanted to kill all the Jews without mercy. And now he pleads for mercy from a Jew. Warren Wearsmer in his commentary on Esther says, When the authority of the king had been behind him, Haman arrogantly strutted about demanding respect. But when the anger of the king was against him, Haman's true character was revealed. He's not a giant. He was a midget full of pride and hot air and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put him and his life back together again. And on the couch of this Jewish queen he falls all the way from his exalted position as the second in charge over the empire to dishonourable death as a traitor. Haman chose or chose to ignore the warnings that he'd been given and had no idea that he was getting himself, what he was get, getting into. And he only had himself to blame. Now listen carefully. 
I want to remind you of an awesome truth that on the one hand it should send shivers down your spine but on the other hand it's a precious comforting promise Galatians 6 and 7 do not be deceived God cannot be mocked a man reaps what he sows <clears throat> Haman sowed anger against Mordecai and he reaped the king's anger Haman wanted to kill the Jews now he himself was killed and this unchanging principle is illustrated throughout all the pages of scripture and whether you're a Christian or not the principle is true whatever you sow in life you're going to reap one way or another one time or another remember Jacob killed an animal and lied to his father pretending to be Esau and years later Jacob's sons killed an animal and lied to him pretending to be Joseph Pharaoh gave orders to drown all the Jewish baby boys and one day his mighty army of men was drowned in the Red Sea and David secretly took his neighbor's wife and committed adultery and his own son then took his father's concubines and committed adultery with them and furthermore David arranged to have Bathsheba's husband killed in battle and three of his sons were also killed and Paul before he was saved encouraged the stoning of Stephen who became a martyr but when he became a missionary he himself was stoned if we sow in the flesh we will reap corruption but the opposite is wonderfully true if we sow in the spirit if we allow the life of Christ within us to transform us we will reap everlasting life because nothing ever done in Jesus name even giving the, the giving of a cup of water we're told will be wasted or ignored but will receive Christ's reward but notice this it wasn't until the king pronounced the sentence of death that Haman's evil plotting was finally over and ended. Verse 8. As soon as the word left the king's mouth. And listen, here's the last truth that you need to hear about gaining victory over the world and the flesh and the devil. It's not until you and I agree with God that revealed sinful ways no longer have a right to live in our lives that we will find deliverance from their power and their influence. In the language of Paul in Romans chapter 6, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. Haman being hung on the gallows that he had built for Mordecai is a classic example of something that actually happens all the time. Psalm 7 verses 14 through 16, there are people who think up evil and plan trouble and tell lies, they dig a hole to trap others, but they will fall into it themselves. They will get themselves into trouble. The violence they cause will hurt only themselves. You know, it's been said that the most, uh, uh, the most difficult instrument in the orchestra is the second fiddle. Haman didn't just want Mordecai executed because he couldn't be number one if Mordecai was around. He was the kind of person that wasn't going to stop plotting until he had the king's throne, even. And even then, he wouldn't have been satisfied. And you know, our culture today is very Hamanistic in sports, in entertainment, in business. The all consuming goal is to be number one. And tragically, tragically this warped thinking can easily creep into our spiritual lives as well. And we tend to be quick to assess the good or the bad in others, but much slower to see it accurately in ourselves. Well, the word that brings victory is actually four words. Hang him on it. That is on the tree. You see, nothing else will work. And that needs to be said every time the human spirit, anything of the old nature, rises within us. Sin doesn't need, doesn't need to, to rule in your life because if we believe that what has been revealed to us is a sinful thing, like jealousy or resentment or bitterness or unforgiveness or whatever it may be, 
And we call, we, we, we recall that this is what put Jesus Christ to death when he took our place on the tree. Then we can say, yes, Lord, hang it on the tree. When jealousy burns within you over something, hang it on the tree. When self-pity comes along and tempts you to feel sorry for yourself, hang it on the tree. When self-will arises and says, I'm doing it my way and I don't care, hang it on the tree. When resentment flames because you've been ignored or you've been mistreated, hang it on the tree. When the critical spirit whispers to you to gossip about someone or destroy someone's reputation or harm someone, hang it on the tree. When unforgiveness eats away at your spirit, folks, hang it on the tree. Simply say, Lord Jesus, because I see this through your eyes as a sinful thing that it is in my life, and standing here in the light of your cross, I will put my will alongside yours, Lord, and I agree. Hang it on the tree. Put it in the place of death where it belongs. Hang it there. And folks, that's the only way to live a life, life of victory and one that's pleasing to God. I am crucified with Christ, and yet not, not I that live, but Christ lives within me. Let's bow in prayer for a moment. I've had a lot to listen to, a lot to take in, hopefully something to learn. And maybe already this morning, here in this precious holy place, because this is holy ground, because God is here, maybe already God has spoken to you about something, something that you've said that you shouldn't have said. Something that you've done that you wish you hadn't done. Something that you've been thinking about that's not worthy of God. Father, we, we come to you in these moments before we come to your table to reflect, Lord, to examine ourselves like you call us. And Father, we want to adopt that attitude to the old nature. There is nothing, Lord, that will stop it except when it's crucified, as you were crucified for our sin on the cross. So, Lord, bring to remembrance anything that we need to know this morning, that we can deal with it, and we can say to you, Lord, I agree with you concerning that. It's not what you would want me to think or to say or to do. So, Lord, forgive me. Hang it on the tree, Lord, crucify it, that it may no longer have power in my life. And help me, Lord, to live for you, to be a blessing, Lord, to others, and to bless your name. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name.